Please don't think we're rude when we run straight off to the interview. So all that happens is um, we, we have a live performance which we were hoping you were going to do for us, but I know your time was crazy. So while they sound check, we're here, and then immediately after, we have to <laughs> run that side okay. to start. No yes. Okay, it's eight minutes after two o'clock. It's the second and final hour of 702 Afternoons, and I'm just going to get straight into it because I already know we don't have enough time this hour. The Upside of Failure, we are joined by multi-award winning, Grammy-nominated singer and songwriter, Mr. Kenny Lattimore, as well as 702 Unplugged with the Drakensberg Boys Choir School, and I'm so looking forward to that performance performance because I've actually sung at the a boys choir school and you might be wondering how did you as a girl go and sing at the boys choir school but I'll tell you that story when we are chatting to them give us a call 011-883-0702 and the whatsapp line 0727021702 any of your questions or comments for Kenny Lattimore you might be wondering why is he in the country it's to visit me. No, just kidding. There's a concert that he's got coming up tomorrow, and we'll tell you all about that. It's nine minutes after two o'clock. Like how? But Kenny said for you, and then right. what? You know what? He made vows publicly, and I, I always find it hard because we're so um, we're so married to the music, and we 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 almost make that your identity. But true, that's, very that's true. not who you are. It's not who we are. So so who are you outside of? These vowels. Okay, well, first I want to say, Rile Bojile, ah! your name is beautiful. And uh, I feel like I am, I am a father. Mm. I'm a loyal person. I'm a humanitarian. I'm a, a, uh, a husband now. I am um, an honest person. I'm a trustworthy. I'm, sin I'm sincere. Yes. Um, I'm learning now to describe myself through character as opposed to my job. Yes. Because most, uh, maybe women do this as well, most men definitely we identify ourselves with the work that we do and we say that that is who we are when it isn't. Yes. It is all of these other characteristics. But um, when I think of the, the whole marriage vow, um, I believe in it still. I believe that, uh, that the type of love and commitment has to be made by two people that are committing to the same commitment. And a lot of times people are not. And when the relationship ends, um, we, we call it a failure. We do call it a failure. But but I have to ask you, before you continue about sure. reaching the part where the relationship ends, I think yes. the tricky part about relationships is because we are evolving, Yes. the goalpost regularly moves. It does. And we regularly have to be like, are we still on the same team? Exactly. Are we still going to that goalpost? So even if... On, on Monday, we say we're committing to this. Mm -hmm. Friday, I might be like, actually, I know we said we're trying to get settled in Bryanston, mm -hmm. but I just got this amazing opportunity <laughs> in New York. Now the goalpost has shifted. So you're also always hoping that you're committing to the same thing every day. Exactly. And it's the day-to-day -day that will either make it live or fall apart. But what people have to be is a lot broader in their thinking towards their relationship with another person sacrificially. Because if I understand that your goal and your dream is to travel and mm. to be in all of these places and that's very important to you, then I'm to, to love you as I love myself. If I were you, what would I want somebody to do for me? I would want a, somebody to cheer me on and say, I understand your goal, babe. I'll, I'll hold down the fort here and I'll do whatever it takes so that you can live your dream as well and we will make this happen because we're committed to us as a team. Mm, somebody say do amen. It. Somebody <laughs> say, and the reason you you mentioned such a critical word, the sacrificial part, yeah. which when you think about it idyllically, mm -hmm. you will always think of sacrifice in whatever circumstances are that you yes. exist in, but you never think about what would it look like if this person were in a car accident and now oh. they're paralyzed from the neck down. So we never think about the sacrifice right. in the circumstances we are yet to experience. So you are constantly trying to build mm -hmm. capacity for things that you don't even know are there. Yeah. And you only will, will know when you get tested. Yep, and I love the fact that you use the word capacity. That's a very important word because we have different capacities for different things. Um, I remember my, my grandfather, when my mother died, he did not have the capacity to come to the funeral. Oh. He just didn't. Mm. 
Now, I could be angry with him to this day and be like, you didn't come to my, you didn't do like I did. Mm. But sacrificially, I have to listen to him and say, who are you, though? And how can I be committed to loving you as my grandfather and understanding who you are and what you deal with? It's something that's, that's very different that I may never have to deal with, but I have to acknowledge it as truth. He did not have the capacity to go. So now, having been remarried, yes, um, and you, you, we use the word failure, mm -hmm. even though we know, we learn, yes, we, we know, we learn and we grow, <laughs> and we also understand that if a marriage was meant to be five years, <laughs> yes, you not knowing, yeah, that is God's That's plan, it. the universe's plan, mm -hmm. or your ancestors' mm -hmm. plan, mm -hmm. then it succeeded it for succeeded. the time that it needed to. Absolutely, and that is the way that I choose to live my life, looking at each moment as a, a teaching or teachable lesson and a period of growth and accepting that. And a lot of times we don't want to accept it because we have an ideal that something is supposed to last forever. But, um, but when you have two people with two different ideals from different backgrounds, I cannot control what another person does. And there are things that we find that we don't have the capacity for. Mm -hmm. Some people get into relationships and then what if your spouse becomes an alcoholic? Or, or gets on drugs. Do you have the capacity to stay in that relationship mm -hmm. in spite of whatever abuse may take place? Some things are, are, are abusive to the point where you, you should not stay. It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people say we're staying for the kids. And it's like, no, the kids don't need to learn dysfunction from you. Mm -hmm. Because that's what happens when you stay in relationships that are unhealthy in front of children. If you're depending on how you're communicating. Mm -hmm. Because if you're communicating in a way that... Uh, does not uh, give the children something to model, it can be something offensive and it can be something that's a turn off from them having healthy relationships. Even if you're not communicating, which is the other thing. Oh, the, they, absolutely. They're There's just, another one. They're <laughs> just going to mirror whatever you're doing. Exactly. So if dad is ignoring mom or vice versa, they're like, oh, okay, this is how this we is handle how things. Yep. So one is mad at the other, now they're not, too, okay, this yep. looks normal. So when we come back from our ad break, I want to touch on your childhood. Sure. Because obviously our views mm -hmm. on big concepts like the yes. word failure change as we get older. So when we come back from the break, 011 883 702 in the WhatsApp line, 07 702 I'm interested in little Kenny, oh, the right. five, the seven-year-old, <laughs> The one reaching puberty, that little guy. <laughs> All right. You happy so far? Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. I can't tell if this is on you. Is it on it you? Is. I didn't yes. cut your head off. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I see you all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I could talk to you about relationships for hours. Oh, wow. Like, it is very deep. Going through, well, we'll get into more of it, but yeah, going through the divorce, um, and we'll, it, it just taught me so much about me. And somebody said, what will you do differently? We are never allowed back into this house. three to six on 702. The community sc school, schoolwork. Yes. A lot of times, your grades. Mm. I didn't have any failing grades, but I, I maybe was taught to fear that mm. failure, and to if, if I was going to get a bad grade, it was going to be something negative yes. for me. I think that's my first recollection of the word failure. At what point in your life, because school is a place where we usually start to engage with other people, yes. figure out, oh, I like this person, or I don't like this person, I'm making friends. What was that experience like for you? I was deathly shy yes. and introverted. And um, as a result of that, music gave me a uh, voice, allowed me to be seen. Uh, but you're talking about maybe around 10 years old. So the, mm. so the first 10 years, I was singing to myself. I was taking in all of this great music, my parents' music that I was listening to around the house, Stevie Wonder and Aretha Franklin and all these different people, Shaka Khan, and I would take it and I'd sing with my, whatever little voice I had. Mm. And I'd sing those hit songs and I just knew whatever I knew, the words. I didn't understand the meanings, yeah. but I understood the words. Um, or I, I memorized the words. So then, my mother, I remember coming to me at 12 and saying, would you like to take voice lessons? I didn't know what voice lessons was. Mm -hmm. But she said, there's something different about you in how you're singing these songs. It's not, you're not sitting around singing like all the other kids. Mm -hmm. And I had no clue. But I went and I took voice lessons and that, it just changed my whole life. I think 
your mother also noticed how you felt when you were singing. Oh, that, yes. Because sometimes it's not even about, oh, he sounds like he sings better than the other kids. Mm -hmm, it's right. like, he looks really happy doing this thing. Uh, yes. So let's go with this thing. Yes. I, I received that. I think uh, my mother was a visionary. She, I, she could almost see into the future. She was, good. she was the one that would go out and say, hey, I was looking on a bulletin board and I found a band for you to join. And I was like maybe 14 and these yes. men were like 30 or 26 yes. to 30 years old. But she would introduce me to the band and all of a sudden I'm working professionally before I even knew that it was a possibility that it could be a job or anything like that. She introduced that to me. So at, at one point now, this thing you're loving to do and yes. enjoying and sort of finding your voice within, yes. as in you're finding the words um, from this very introverted personality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it some point becomes a business. It becomes a business. And I think what many people don't know is that you might be this amazing singer and in your mind you're like, I love soul, I love jazz. Yeah. And then business says, well, hmm, the radio stations <laughs> are, ain't playing. You right. know, let's try and... Did you ever find yourself confronted with trying to figure out Absolutely. what genre, you know, and also and the, the fear of it possibly boxing you? Yeah, okay. I was dropped from Columbia Records after From the Soul of Man. So if you can imagine, I had all that success with my first two albums and all yes. the songs that you know and love, yes. South Africa, and the record company said, we don't want to do business with him anymore. And initially I felt like, whoa, this could possibly, is this a Why? failure? What's going to, they decided they did not want to do adult black music. That's what in, in America they call it, like adult black music. Uh, what they wanted to do was hip hop and they wanted to try other things. Yes. So, um, they kept maybe two artists, in, and I wasn't the only one. Alicia Keys was with me, and she was dropped from the label. So you called and you're like, girl, at least we're together. Right, <laughs> right. you know. <laughs> they dropped it's so you crazy. too. <laughs> and she, she was my uh, my opening act, actually, oh my goodness. For, uh, for the From the Soul of Man tour. And all of a sudden, Clive Davis took both of us, and it became validating because he, he was going, I wonder why they dropped. He, he was confused. The biggest yeah. record executive in the entire world was like, they let you go? Hmm. And they didn't hold the, us in, in any part of the contract like you still owe us money. or anything. They just were like, nope, we don't want to do business with you anymore. Wow. So that was psychologically, it, it played with my mind. It's a, it's a head mm. trip because this is an ego-driven business anyway. We, we live a, a, we live rejection. off of you telling us that we that you love us. <laughs> it's a rejection of sorts. It's a rejection of sorts, yeah. which still has a, a, a tinge of failure that mm. to it. You know, it feels like that. So the validation was to to go with Clive Davis. But then, over and over again, I went through situations where the people that signed me or were, that were doing business with me were fired, and as a result, I was out. Mm. Because when different regimes come in, they kind of they, they let go of all of the old regime and they start over. And I do understand that. But in terms of artistry, um, I thought I was more valuable than that. And I was because people kept calling. Every if, if one label didn't work, another label would call. And I just got so tired of it. After a while, I said, let me try the independent route. Mm. The independent route was very difficult. And I realized I was in over my head mm. with promoting and all that. I didn't understand it all and I had to go to a label and say hey can you buy me out of a contract because yeah. I don't know what I'm doing and it wasn't until that company bought me out that they taught me a little bit more about the business so that I could operate as an independent after that but it took me going it was a scary time I had a single called find a way and mm -hmm. during that time I, I got it up to maybe 13 on the charts very difficult to do and um, yeah and I think the, um, the, the, the pressure and all of the dynamics that just come with, you know, the dream is have, go number one, do a great album. And yeah. then afterwards, now you're like, okay, now you have to do better. Yeah. So this, it, st it keeps getting harder and harder. Yeah. Um, I would like to take a voice note that's come sure. through. Hi, Kikopa, please ask Kenny. I love Kenny. Love, love, love Kenny. All these beautiful things that he sings about, that he writes about, that he probably imagined. When did he realize? Where, like, when did he realize? Sorry, he needs to start living them. What was that light bulb moment? As I would say, when did he realize? Sorry, no, I need to start living 
these things. Yeah. Thanks. Mm, wow. That is a deep question. Yeah, when did I? When? Mm. I think um, I had been living them. I come from a, a, a Christian faith background. Mm. So um, what a lot of people don't know, and I've been talking about recently in interviews, is that I wanted to be like B.B. and C.C. Winans mm. initially when I came out. And I ended up becoming the R&B singer. But I was always trying to imitate this life that I read about of Jesus Christ that I was reading in the Bible because I thought that he was so strong in mm -hmm. terms of how he loved and then how he made his decisions, who he walked with. All of the decisions were like really precise. It wasn't religious stuff. Mm. It was like, this is an example of love and sacrifice that is just purely amazing. How can I be like this? Congratulations with a little you. one on the way. Thank you so much. A little girl. <laughs> a little girl. <laughs> Are you like so excited? Yeah, I get to teach her how she should be treated. Mm. I get to teach her how she she should be loved so that she can make great decisions. Because I didn't always make great decisions um, coming up. Um, not seeing on a consistent basis of health, those healthy relationships and how to display love. And um, now that I feel a lot more settled in understanding who I am, because that's the one thing you do learn in divorce, you learn a lot about yourself. I learned that I needed to, to communicate differently because I thought, you know, well, I'm a nice guy. I used to kind of tiptoe around things in my first marriage and I, and I, I didn't speak like straight up, this is what's honest, this mm -hmm. is not right, this is mm -hmm. wrong over here or that. I was trying to, to navigate uh, the growth of another person. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I want to teach my, my girl things like that early, you know, how to navigate other people growing and, and giving them the grace, but not selling yourself short, always choosing yourself because you can't be great to anybody else if you're not good to you. You cannot pour from an empty cup. No, can cannot. 